Hi, I'm Jonathan Kress from the University of New South Wales and I'm going to explain how to solve one of the calculus problems from Math 1131. It's Chapter 5, Question 17. And in that question we have a polynomial P, in fact a cubic polynomial, and the question asks us uh, to, um, ha well, how many real zeros does P have? And we're not just going to draw a graph and, uh, and count it and uh, you know, look at the picture to do it, we're going to actually going to use some uh, theorems. Okay? Drawing the graph is a good way to understand the problem, but we want to actually uh, use some theorems to guarantee a certain number of roots. Okay, the theorems we're going to use are the intermediate value theorem, and that's a theorem um, for a continuous function f, and if it's continuous on this closed interval from a to b, the theorem says that if we pick a value z that lies between the value of the function at the ends of this interval, so f of a and f of b, then there must be one um, real solution to the equation f of c equals that z. And we're in particular going to choose z to be zero because we're interested to find, uh, to know if there's a solution um, of f to f of f of c equals um, zero. In other words, a zero. So well, the f we're going to be using is this p in the question. And the other theorem we'll use is one that you probably uh, didn't think it was a theorem, but you knew the result. And, and that says that uh, for a function which is continuous and differentiable on some interval, um, if its derivative is positive over the whole interval, then it's increasing on the interval. And if its derivative is negative over the whole interval, then it's decreasing on the interval. And if its derivative is zero, then it's constant on the interval. Okay, so we'll use this theorem and this theorem. And we'll use them for different things. This one here allows us to prove that um, within an interval, there is at least one zero. Okay, and this interval, this theorem will allow us to um, say if we know there is a zero on the interval, but we then also know that the function is increasing or perhaps it's just decreasing, then there must only be one zero. Okay, so that'll allow us to um, count the number of zeros as long as we choose the intervals on which we apply these theorems carefully. Okay, and the way to choose them, and uh, it might be clearer at the end why we, why we make this choice, is to divide uh, the real line up into uh, intervals which are divided at the points where there's uh, a stationary point. So let's first of all find the stationary points for P. So um, let's just say uh, P has stationary points when uh, P dashed of X equals zero. Okay, so that is, we want zero to be p dashed of x, which is equal to 3x squared minus 24x plus 45, and that factors nicely into uh, 3x minus 3, x minus 5. Okay. So P has stationary points, and I've just abbreviated stationary points to SPs, we've already, already written it out there, um, at 3 and 5. Okay, now we're going to divide the real line up at 3 and 5 and look at the intervals that we obtain uh, and, and look for zeros and prove that there's, if, if there's a zero there's only one. Okay, so here's the real line. So let's call that x. Here's 3 and 5. And I'm going to indicate the sign of p. I'm not, I'm not going to draw the graph completely, but I'll just write down what the, what the p, sorry, not the sign of p, the sign of p dashed, the sign of the derivative, whether the derivative is positive or negative. Okay, now on the interval um, uh, from minus infinity to 3, uh, because p dashed is a quadratic with positive leading coefficient, uh, over here it's, uh, it's definitely got to be positive. And similarly over here, when we're greater than 5, it's going to be positive as well. And in the middle between the two roots, um, if you pick a number between 3 and 5, one of these factors is negative and one is positive. In the middle it's... Uh, got a negative derivative. Okay, now um, 
we're going to uh, try to show that there must be a zero or perhaps find that there isn't a zero on each of these intervals. Uh, and then we would like to um, be able to say that if there, is a, if there is a zero, then there's only one. And that's uh, where this, is, this, this theorem will come in. So I'm just going to indicate where, where the function is increasing. If the derivative is positive, the theorem tells us the function is increasing. So here. And I'll just sort of indicate it like that. I'm not really drawing the graph. I'm just indicating that it's increasing there and it's increasing here. And uh, in the middle, the function is decreasing. Like so. Okay. Now, um, I would like to uh, evaluate um, P at the endpoints of some interval to be able to use the intermediate value theorem. We just need to choose the points. Now, um, maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, this interval in the middle where we've got um, 3 and 5. And we can see that between 3 and 5 it's decreasing. So if there is a 0 in there, uh, then uh, there, must be, there must be only 1. And um, P of 3 is equal to, I worked this out before, if you plug it into there you get 3, after a little bit of work. P of um, 5 is minus 1. And so um, P of 3 is a positive number. I'll just move that over a bit. More room. P of 3 is 3, and that's, pos that's greater than 0. Remember I said we're going to take zero, um, Z to be 0 in this theorem. Uh, P of 5 is minus 1, that's negative. And you can see now we've found uh, it's, the function is greater than 0 when uh, x is 3 and uh, at, at 3 and it's less than 0 at 5. So if we choose the interval from 3 to 5 and apply the intermediate value theorem to it, then uh, because uh, p is continuous, uh, we can conclude that there must be a 0 in there. So um, I'll just write down here, since p is continuous, Um, on uh, the interval from 3 to 5, um, the, I'm going to just abbreviate intermediate value theorem to IVT. And the intermediate value theorem uh, tells us that P has a zero. It doesn't tell us whether there's only one. It, there might be more than one. It just tells us there certainly is one. So you might say it has at least one, or it has a zero on three five. Okay, so we know that there is um, a zero in here. Okay, now this theorem here tells us that, be, that um, because the derivative is negative um, in that interval, then it's, um, uh, there can only, it, 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 the function is decreasing and there could only be one zero. Okay, so um, I'll just say since p dashed is negative on 3, 5, it is decreasing and hence there is only one zero, or I should say P has, and hence P has only one zero. On three five. So this this is a uh, typical of how you uh, approach this problem. You find uh, intervals on which you think there might be a zero, and if you can show there is a zero, you then want to uh, show that there's only one. So of course you need to choose the interval correctly so that those things are true. 
And it's possible, of course, you might find an interval between two stationary points where there was no zero. But uh, in this case, there is. OK. Now we want to uh, check the intervals out here. Certainly, on this interval here, there can only be one. I might turn this around. I might do these two uh, a little bit together. And I'll say that on this interval and this interval, it, uh, P is increasing. And so on each of those intervals, there could be at most, there could only be one zero. OK. Since P. Uh, is increasing on the interval from minus infinity to 3 and, and also on the in interval from 5 to infinity. I'll say P P can have at most one zero on each interval. Okay, so this we're using this theorem here, and of course, um, actually, I haven't written it up, but uh, we're using the fact that P is differentiable. Okay. Right. So, um, okay, I might just put that at the top here. Go back up. Note that P is differentiable on the whole of the real line. Okay, so that uh, we can apply this theorem. Okay, now since p is increasing from minus infinity to three and on from five to infinity, we can have at most one zero there. But we haven't shown that there, there, there is a zero. So we'd like to do that. Now, of course, um, this value here, uh, p is positive. And you know that for a cubic, it's gonna get uh, as big as big and negative as you like over here. So we can only, because we can only apply the intermediate value theorem on an interval of this form, we really do, we really should check, you know, pick another point. And let's, um, Let's pick uh, zero as well. So let's also note that um, P of zero is minus 51, which is negative. And I chose P of zero because I could see easily that it was going to be a negative value. Um, so I'll say just say, given that P of zero is minus 51 and P of three is three, The intermediate value theorem, we've already, um, I haven't said it's, it's continuous on, on this interval, uh, I should say that. So because, because it's negative at zero and positive at three and continuous on the interval, the intermediate value theorem, IVT, uh, says P has a zero on that interval. And we've already said that it can only have one because we've already said in this, in, it, it can only have, only have one, it, one zero in this interval, so it could only have one zero there. And let's also now look at the last interval, P of 5 we calculated to be minus 1 which is negative and P of, let's just take 10 and I just guess that 10 is going to do the job 10 should be big enough to make it give us a positive number this turns out to be 199 you could put a million in here if you wanted to but uh, one, nine, 10 will do uh, P of 10 is 99 which is positive and um, p and I'll just I'll just write continuous. Uh, I shouldn't really say p is continuous. Continuous on five to ten. Maybe I'll put p is here and p is continuous. 
P is continuous on 5 to 10. Okay, the intermediate value theorem says P has a zero on 5, 10. Okay, so um, we've shown that it's got a zero on between zero and three, and so it certainly has a zero on this interval. It has a zero on five to 10, so it's certainly got a zero on this interval. And we've shown also it has a zero here. And on each of those intervals, it's got only one. So all of that together tells us that P has exactly three zeros. Okay.